Christianity is a taught religion. There are so many, many references that prove this particular statement. I'll only mention one or two because I'm quite sure that you are familiar with them. In the scripture reading that we just had, they shall all be taught of God. Whosoever therefore hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. But first of all, of course, we have to be taught, don't we? Then in Romans 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they trust in him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? In the very first beatitude that Jesus gave, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the poor in spirit are the only ones that can be taught. You can't teach anyone that's proud and haughty and arrogant. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the teachable people, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we notice another scripture or two along this particular line that Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 14, we are called by the gospel, by the gospel, not through a direct operation of the Holy Spirit moving separate and independent from his word, but rather through the gospel. I think we're well acquainted that the, with the fact that the Great Commission begins with the teacher. Matthew 28 and verse 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach. And thus, whenever we start out to convert the world, it begins with the lowly, humble, submissive, dedicated teacher. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing the ones you have taught, and then continue to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We find out in Ephesians 3 and verse 10 that the church is the teaching institution of God, that by the church is to be made known unto the world the manifold wisdom of God. We also find out a few things about the church in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, writing to the saints of God in the church at Corinth, and he said, Ye are God's building. In Hebrews 3 and verse 9, he said, Ye are God's house. In 1 Corinthians 12 and in verse 27, he says that ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. If the body is going to function as it ought to, then, of course, the members will have to function as they ought to. And in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul likens the church unto the human body. And he says that the hand would not say unto the eye, because I'm not the seeing, I'm no part of the body. Neither would the ear say, because I'm not the tongue and not the speaking, that I'm no part of the body. But each one of us have our particular function. And all of us fitly compacted together, the King James Version said, Make the body of Christ to be something beautiful, alive, and vibrant, and useful. Whenever the human body has one limb that wants to go one way and another that wants to go another, and still another limb that rebels against the two decisions that's been made, we call them an epileptic. And many times the body of Christ is made an epileptic simply because we have some members working at cross purposes with others and not all working in the harmonious relationship that they should to preach the gospel to the whole world. They shall all be taught of God, and that responsibility falls upon your shoulders and upon mine. There are many ways in which we can teach. The radio and television we are well acquainted with in this congregation, maybe not as much so as we ought to be, but nevertheless well acquainted with them. Not only that, but newspaper ads. I remember talking to a preacher of a denomination in another city who said, I never fail to read the Church of Christ ads, the articles that are written by your preachers in advertising the church. Thus, there is a method of teaching through the newspaper, through the tracts, the printed page. During our meeting, some four or five hundred tracts left this building every night. Those tracts are still teaching of God wherever they are unless they have been destroyed, of course. Many different ways of teaching through correspondence courses that we have. I do not know how many people are taking correspondence courses on the Bible through this congregation, but I do know of some 12 or 14 prisoners in the Texas Penal Institution that are taking correspondence courses from this particular congregation. Just last week, week before last now, I wrote to the chaplain who is a member of the church down at Huntsville and gave him the names of some of the men that had signified that they wanted to obey the gospel. We have some that have been making not only good grades, but have been making excellent grades, studying God's word. That is another method of teaching. I've said a great deal since I have been here about cottage meetings. I doubt that I've said half enough. But nevertheless, I have said a great deal about them, and that is another method of teaching, going into people's homes. But I want you to know that we are riding right now the highest crest and the highest wave of religious interest ever known in the history of our country. I do not know that there has ever been a time that there have been so many folks enrolled in Sunday school and in church 
percentage-wise in our country as there is right now. I do not know how long this world will stand. I know that Mr. Khrushchev has given us 12 more years, and he says that the communist world is ahead of schedule in taking the world for communism. Now, I want you to know that there's one thing that we need, brother and sister in Christ, whether there was one communist in the world or one billion of them, and that is we need a crash program for Christ. If we'd put the multiplied billions of dollars into a crash program for Christ that we put into armament, then we'd take the world for Christ and there'd be no worry about whether I need a bomb shelter or a fallout shelter or not. I noticed down in Houston, Texas, two or three weeks ago in the Houston Post, this particular stirring bit of information, that if the 50 megaton bomb that Russia exploded in the atmosphere had been exploded in Houston, or anywhere else for that matter, that it would have left a hole in the earth 400 feet deep and five miles across. Mankind now has at his power and at his fingertips the power to blow himself into oblivion. And I want you to know whether that comes or whether it does not, that still we have a God enjoined responsibility to teach the world about Jesus Christ. I was moved yesterday as I read in the Bold Home News some excerpts from a letter written by a communist to an acquaintance in America telling of his dedication to communism. You and I would call him a rank fanatic. But when we compare our dedication, question mark, to Christianity, to his dedication to communism, it makes us look awfully shabby, awfully shabby. I think we'll put some excerpts in the bulletin next week from that letter. I think it would do us good to realize why that the communists have grown in 58 years from 17 people to dominate one-third of the world's population today, while you and I have been playing around and talking about these things and theorizing about them. One of the greatest opportunities, one of the greatest opportunities that we have for teaching God's Word is in our Bible class department, in our Bible school. I know that many congregations of the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ teach or rather treat the Sunday school or Bible study hour as a stepchild, as a necessary evil. It's just one of those things, and we push it off into the background, relegate it back there into the background, and it just grows sometimes in spite of itself not because of any dedication or any work or any energy on our part. But in our Bible classes, we have an opportunity for reaching every age group that there is in Abilene, Texas. And even though Abilene is a town of many churches and church-related schools and a town of many Bibles, over 60,000 people on Sunday morning do not attend services anywhere. If you look for a mission field, this one is veritably ripe under the harvest. We're living in a city in which there are at least 10,000 children who are growing up in complete spiritual illiteracy and whose parents would be happy for someone to take them off of their hands and teach them God's Word. And I hope that there's none of us that would look upon this and say, well, I don't think those ragamuffins would be much help to us. How about being like Christ and saying, what kind of help can we be for them instead of what kind of help can they be for us? I hope that at Fifth and Highland or anywhere else it never gets to where we have to look into the bank account of a person to determine whether he'd be any good for us before we wanted him for a member or not. God forbid that that should ever be in the heart of anyone that claims to be a child of God. Any congregation that has an active, dynamic teaching program is a growing congregation. Any congregation that has an active, dynamic teaching program is a growing congregation. Others are just swelling up a little bit. Now I want you to know that when our Bible school department grows, that the membership grows spiritually. Not only that, but the contribution grows, and the membership grows numerically. And the world is a better place in which to live any time, anywhere that we can instill some of these principles in someone's heart. Now I hope and trust that we have no teachers in the Bible school department here that look upon the Bible class work as filling in so much time or filling in the blanks. There's far more to it than that. And let's teach these principles, whether it's a preschool or whether it's the aged class, let let people know that these words are practical, that they are words to live by, that they're not just good Sunday school material and good sermon material, but we are to have them stamped indelibly in our heart, and we are to be epistles known and read of all men everywhere. My, when I think of the potential that this congregation has, I tremble. I'll tell you quite frankly, I have never been associated with any congregation anywhere in the world with as much potential as this one has. I have never in my life seen a congregation so blessed with ability and with talent and with people willing to use them. And I'll tell you this, that if we can just channel all of this in one direction, we'll take the world for Christ. 
And this congregation, by virtue of the fact of the herald of truth and other things, is, I suppose, about as well known as any throughout the brotherhood. And anything that we do will not only renown to his name's honor and glory here, but it will give encouragement and inspiration to others in far distant places and near places. And I do not want and I did not come to Abilene to empty any church buildings to fill Highland. And as long as people are happy and are working in the faithful congregation, then as far as I'm concerned, they can stay there in power to them. And anything that I can do to help them and to encourage them, I want to do that. And I've spoken in several of the congregations to that end since I've been in Abilene. And I'd ask you, I couldn't order you, but I'd ask you as brothers and sisters in Christ, don't try to get those that are happy and contented that are working in other congregations to leave that congregation and come over here. That congregation needs them as badly as we do. There are so many peoples in Abilene that we could take into the membership of the church here that we could convert. There are so many out-of-duty members of the church that we could, if we had the dedication and would work at the job, we could rejuvenate them, that we'd have no need for robbing other churches. God forbid that we should do that for several reasons, and I won't even talk about that. You know, the formula for success that we have is a very unpopular one, and it's called work. Take a lot of work. It just takes a lot of work, anything that's good. I don't know of anything that's worthwhile in life that comes easy. I haven't found it. There's some things that aren't worthwhile that come easy. As a matter of fact, they're handed to you on a satin pillow sometimes, on a silver tray. But the things that are worthwhile of eternal value, Satan's going to see to it that they don't come easy. It's going to take a lot of work on the part of a lot of people. Brother Lemoyne Lewis has been calling for volunteers here for his teaching department. I didn't ask him to take the time to count them because he's been very busy here in the last few weeks preparing for our two Bible studies next week. But I want to commend you. Well over a hundred people have volunteered to teach these classes. How many, I don't know, but he said I'd be safe in saying well over a hundred people. That thrills my heart to find people like that. It's an encouragement to me to find those that would come without someone going and twisting their arm or trying to push them or coerce them into it or browbeat them into it. Over a hundred people that would volunteer to come and teach. And he said, I'd be safe in saying that even though in, with the divided Bible school sessions, having two sessions of it, that we'll average having more than four teachers to each class at both sessions. That's a wonderful thing. I want to commend you. I just can't say enough in regard to that. I know that you didn't do it for me, and because of that, I love you more. Because you had a more noble purpose in mind than that. It's going to give you an opportunity to go to work yourself. It'll give you an opportunity to develop your talents, whatever they are, even to a higher degree. It'll give you an opportunity to reach out and teach others, to reclaim the lost, to lead the lost to Christ, to lead back those that have wandered away. And you are the one that will receive the great blessing. It'll give us an opportunity to have many more workers in the congregation. And whenever we get people started teaching, they have to start studying. And when they start studying, they just cannot help but grow. You just can't help it. There have been some here that have thanked me personally for the cottage meeting training that we've given in the home. Mid, I've been intending to learn the Old Testament for years. I knew that I ought to, but I just never would do it until somebody came and set up a class and invited me and encouraged me and helped me just a little bit. This is going to help you to grow. And when we have some 300 people that are teaching God's Word and studying and preparing and working and visiting, we're going to find a revival in the church. We're going to find that enthusiasm is contagious, and I hope to see an epidemic started. We've been thinking about it. We've been talking about it. We've been stuttering along about it about long enough. Let's all put our shoulder to the wheel, and let's all move in the same direction. Listen, if things keep on going like they're going, With the same zeal and enthusiasm, and those of you that have dedicated yourselves to this teaching program, I want to tell you something. In one year from this Sunday, I hope to be standing back in this pulpit and saying, I told you so, but we'll be having over 1,500 in Bible study every Sunday, every Sunday. You just watch. Those of you that are fearful and unbelieving and skeptical, a very small minority, some vociferous about it, but very small minority, you just watch. And instead of trying to pour cold water upon a good program, why don't you too join in with the ranks of those that intend to march for the master? Work is the only way that I know to get it done. Let's notice a few things about work. I know it's an unpopular word. As I've mentioned to you, the Lord, I guess, knew it, but he put it in this book 619 times, which is 600 times more than he mentioned the word baptism. Maybe he thought we ought to catch on just a little bit. 
Maybe our preaching has been just a little bit out of its proper proportion to what the Lord has said for us to preach and to teach about. You know, there is just no place in the kingdom for a lazy person. No matter whether you're teaching a Bible class or not, there is no place in the kingdom of Christ for a lazy person. All the way through this book, it abounds with zeal and enthusiasm. People that are just bubbling over for the Lord. The Christian life is likened unto a contest in which we should strive, a race that we should run, a battle that we should fight, and there's just no place in it for a lazy person. Now, occasionally we run into someone who wants to sound a little more pious than perhaps they are. So when I just don't believe in, in anything big and promotional, now let's tell the truth about it. Really, you're just lazy, and you know that promotion means work. You don't intend to work, do you? Now, that's really the truth about it, isn't it? There's just no end to what we can accomplish if we determine that we're going to do it. Just no end to it. I don't think that anyone should have any legitimate complaint about two Bible studies. You can still come at 9.30 and get out at 11.45. That's what you've been doing all the time anyway. Those of us that will have to be here from 8.30 to 11 might have some complaints. The few that will have to come twice. But I don't see that it should inconvenience any of the rest of you. You can still come at 9.30 and get out at 11. It's just inverted the order of it. You'd have worship first and Bible class second. But that shouldn't be a terrible inconvenience for you. Why don't we grow up just a little bit, brethren and sisters, as the case may be? Let's notice a few things we can do. You know, on this judgment scene in Matthew 25, you know what condemned those people on the left hand? Ye visited me not. The Lord, when he got ready to consign them to the horrors of hell throughout eternity, didn't say you've been getting drunk, you refused to pay your debts, you beat your wife, you'd forsake your children, or any such thing. He simply brought the scathing accusation against them. You visited me not. There's nothing will take the place of visitation. Nothing. I don't care how fancy the scheme is or anything else that you cook up. Nothing will take the place of personal visitation. Brother Bill Fox and I have been working, and you may not believe it, but quite hard, getting a visitation program organized from the office for the church. The individual teachers, of course, will have a visitation program for members of their class. But if you want some work to do in the church, we have down here on either one of these tables in front a volunteer workers card. If you've already signed one, don't sign another. We still have it. Just as soon as we can get some of the kinks ironed out of it, we'll be calling on you, giving you some instructions about how to visit, and letting you make some contacts in the name of the Lord. You say, I don't know how to teach. Well, can you visit? Do you know how to visit? Well, if you don't, we're going to send you a letter with some instructions and telling you how to visit. Some things in general ways not to say and not to do, and some things in a general way to say and to do. These are things that you can do. And if you want to devote your time, read carefully the small print here. And then if you sign it, give it to me or give it to Brother Fox. And we'll be happy to be calling on you and putting you on the list of volunteer workers for a visitation program of this congregation. We want to visit all of the visitors that come to visit us that are not members of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to visit all of the out-of-duty members of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of this congregation, 176 of them right now. We want to visit all of the newcomers that move into town that are members of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a lot of other visitation prospects and others that we can call upon. And you know, when you scatter out the task, then the labor diminishes, doesn't it, for one? Let a few try to carry it on. It's a mammoth program. But everyone making one visit a week, you know what would happen in this congregation? If every member made one visit a week in the interest of the work of the church here, one 20-minute visit a week, before the end of next year, couldn't get them in this auditorium. We did have to start another congregation or have two worship services here. But now, of course, if you don't want to grow or anything, you just stay at home and follow the path of least resistance. And you don't have to sign this and won't anybody be calling on you if you don't. But if you do, we're going to be calling on you. We'll expect you to live up to the vow that you make to your God here on this little card. Nothing will take the place of visitation. You know, some people have the idea. Well, let's build them a nice building and let's air condition it in the summer and central heating in the winter time. And then our attitude is this, even though we wouldn't be honest enough to say it. Here is a building. You can come over here and be taught the truth or you can stay away and go to hell. 
Oh, we wouldn't be so callous as to say that in word, but we say it with our action. Well, here it is, and we put it in the paper. We're having Bible class at 8.30 and at 11. Now you can come if you want to, or stay away and be damned. Either way. You know, the denomination preach the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, and you and I practice it. I wonder which is the word. I wonder which is the word. You know, when a member of the class is absent, we say, well, it's none of my affair. I didn't cause them to be absent. And so often that's our attitude. Well, I know Bill and Jane didn't show up. You know, they missed three or four weeks in a row now, but it's none of my affair. You know what class you put yourself in? That old priest and Levite that rode down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and they found the man out by the side of the road and they said, well, it's none of my affair. <laughs> I'm not really concerned about it. After all, I didn't kill him. I didn't wound him. I didn't hurt him. Not my affair until they rode on by and that's the class you're putting yourself in. Cain asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? And God answered it very emphatically in the long ago. It's just that way. Bear ye one another's burdens. Extend a helping hand one for the other. So fulfill the law of grace or the law of Christ. You know, it's awfully easy to drift. It's easy. The easiest thing in the world to drift, but you can't drift upstream. And a congregation that's satisfied to meet Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night Week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out is doing nothing more nor less than just holding services, keeping house for the Lord, that's all. Congregation that's really not interested in something bigger and better than that has no right to wear the name of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God intended that we should grow, that we should preach the gospel at home and abroad every opportunity that we have. And there's opening up for us next Sunday a wonderful challenge in that we will have plenty of room. We can't use that as an excuse for not growing. We'll have plenty more workers to work. We'll have classes down on a smaller scale where that we can feel an individual responsibility to that class. You know, I can remember when I used to attend classes. It had 50 or 60 in it. I didn't mind missing too badly, going off visiting Uncle Bill and Aunt Susie because they'd never miss me out of 50 or 60. But if there were 10 or 12, I knew they were going to miss me. I knew my chair would be empty and I would be missed. And I felt a little more responsibility to be there because when I was gone, one twelfth of the class was gone. But otherwise, it was just one-sixtieth of the class gone when I missed. And that didn't take such a big hunk out of it, did it? I found out also that I could learn a little more, that there could be class participation. Any time a class gets bigger than 40, there's no need of trying to have any class discussion because it's just lost motion there. Lecture form of teaching is all that you can get across like we're doing here. And that's been proven over and over and over again as one of the poorest forms of teaching that there is. It's teaching all right. It has its place. But there is less learning done in lecture-type teaching than in any other type that we use. And when the class gets over 40, then that's just about all that you can do. The last first four days of this week, I was in Amarillo, citywide teachers training for surface series. These are some of the suggested figures that they gave in that session up there for a Bible class. In the preschool and primary, and of course there are exceptions to these, but generally speaking, no less than six students. No more than 12. They need a lot of individual attention. When you get up into what we call the intermediate and junior high range, no less than 8, no more than 16. When you get into the adult from their own up, no less than 10, no more than 40 in a class. Now that's what the educators have arrived at. We have an opportunity now to have a great diversification of subjects and classes and smaller classes. Now, I know that there will be this temptation on the part of some when maybe two or three show up in one class and the bulk of people in the other. Well, this is not enough to have a class. You know, Jesus thought it was enough to have a class if he had one. If I started out right now, I could just mention you numerous cases where Jesus held a Bible class with one student, one student. And I know from personal experiences, some of the best, most heartening and enlightening classes I've ever had had one or two students in them. But here is a challenge. Surely none of you are so lazy that you'd want somebody to give you a class to teach. Build your own. If there's not but three or four or five or six, you have room for growth, and there are thousands of people all around us that would come if you'd show a personal interest in them. We'll help you. We'll assist you in any way that we can. But we want to grow and not shrivel up. We want to reach out and launch out into the deep and reach into other homes and other communities round about and bring those that are lost unto the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Most of the converts of most any congregation come 
through the Bible school department. Every problem that we have in the brotherhood comes from a lack of teaching. Did you hear that? Every problem that we have in the brotherhood comes from a lack of teaching, without exception. You can name me one that doesn't come from a lack of teaching. What a wonderful opportunity we have as teachers of the Word of God to pave the way and to smooth out the rocky places in life for those that would come after us. As I told the college age class this morning, you older folks knew this before I did, life isn't always a bed of roses. It isn't always calm and placid and beautiful as it sometimes appears on the surface. But there's a mean and ugly, raw side to life. I can't change that. I can't change the old world. But I told those college kids in there that I can help them prepare themselves to stand it. And it's coming. I don't care who you are. You can't lead a life so sheltered that you're not going to be drawn into some of these things. As a woman told me yesterday, we always think of these things happening to someone else. They're so horrible and so terrible and so tragic. We just can't think of them ever happening to us. It's always somebody else, and now it's happened in my family. And I tell you, it happens in every family. Maybe not that particular tragedy, but it happens in every family. And we need to bolster people's faith for those things that are coming. Growth is a sure sign of life. Anything that's growing is a lie. In the mineral, animal, vegetable, or spiritual realm, anything that's growing is a lie. We have reached, or we are fast reaching, a place where we need more room. If you just want to have one Sunday school at one time, that's fine. It'll cost us about $100,000 to build what we need to build. And we can all meet at one session. Or we can use what our facilities that we have twice and do the same thing. Which to you seems the more sensible? I just ask the question. We have a challenge before us. I believe in the good people of Highland that we're going to meet it. I believe with all my heart, I'll mark it on my calendar when I get through tonight, that one year from today, we will be averaging 1,500 people in Bible study. Brother McKnight, are you interested in numbers? In case any of you are scared and worried and concerned and anxious about that, quit worrying about it. I am. I am. And I make no bones about it. Now, to be interested in numbers for numbers' sake is evil and sinful. I know that. But I want you to know that every number represents a human soul. And every human soul is worth more than all the world. And I'm interested in numbers. I'd like to see us teaching the Bible every Sunday morning to 15,000, to 50,000, to 100,000. I don't think there's any virtue in being little, anemic, small, and weak. And let me say to you again, in all the kindness that I know how, if Highland gets too big for you, there are 14 other congregations in town that would welcome your membership. Why try to tear down a good thing just because you're contrary or cantankerous? If you don't think I mean it, you don't know mid night. I told you when I stood in this pulpit the first time that I came down here to work, I don't have time to play marbles. I don't have time to hold services. I don't have time to keep house for the Lord. Unless I outlive my father and my grandfather, I have less than 20 years of active service left. And I don't intend to spend it in keeping house for the Lord. And I'm not angry at anyone, but I just want you to understand my position. We have a wonderful opportunity, brother and sister in Christ, to bring those back to Christ that have wandered away. We have a wonderful opportunity to bring those to Christ that have never come.